how to prepare for training, and my experiences at the J.J. Ricasa class in McHenry, Illinois. This week on Mail Call Mondays. Mail Call Mondays is brought to you by MDT. If you need a chassis system for your precision rifle, check out mdttac.com. I'm John McQuay with 8541 Tactical, and this is Mail Call Mondays, the show that answers your questions about precision rifles, optics, and equipment. And this Monday, we are going to talk about a class that I went to a uh, weekend before last in McHenry, Illinois at Alpha Range. And the class was taught by J.J. Ricasa, who is a world champion shooter in several different disciplines, uh, Steel Challenge, uh, Ipsic, uh, etc. And he's a very talented shooter. Uh, but also a very talented instructor, and he has a huge amount of energy and is uh, a really great presenter, and he has a couple of uh, interesting takes on handgun shooting. Now, me, I am not a very skilled competition shooter. Uh, I can shoot in most of the shooting disciplines, but I do not do so at a very high level. Uh, I am a tactically oriented shooter, which means when I go to the range and I practice, uh, I don't practice stage planning. I don't pra practice the fastest way to run a stage. Uh, I practice uh, what would be tactically significant skills, something that I can use on the street to defend my life uh, as a law enforcement officer or as an armed civilian. Uh, so uh, the way I go about things is a little bit different, but uh, as a firearms instructor, it is very important to continue that ongoing training. And I've been to a lot of tactical training schools, a lot of instructor courses, uh, but sometimes it's nice to reach outside of your norm and try something a little bit different. And uh, the big catch with this uh, J.J. Ricasa class was uh, teaching you how to shoot faster. He calls it stop click banging, uh, which means stop shooting from trigger reset. Uh, so that was the thing that really hooked me, but then there were quite a few other things uh, that really helped me out through the class with uh, movement, target transitions, and moving from shooting position to shooting position. Uh, sometimes it is just really, really helpful to have a very high-level shooter watch what you're doing and then point out little things that you could improve to improve your overall shooting. Uh, and that was the biggest thing I got out of this. But uh, there are a couple of really uh, key nuggets that I pulled away uh, that I'm going to now put into my training. Uh, now, one of the biggest things, again, what drew me to this class uh, was how he goes about manipulating the trigger on the firearm. So uh, right here in front of me, I have the handgun that I brought to the class. This is the SIG P320 X5 Legion. Uh, so this is the latest version of the X5 uh, P320 from SIG, and it has a very heavy tungsten-infused uh, polymer frame, and then a heavy guide rod and a bull barrel, and it is just really a joy to shoot. It is a 9mm handgun, and it is equipped with a Leupold Delta Point Pro on here. Now, I don't have co-witnessed iron sights because this is a competition pistol. Uh, this is not really a tactical pistol. I do have a tactical version of the pistol right here that has a standard polymer frame. Uh, it is not tungsten infused, it is significantly lighter, and it has backup iron sights that are co-witnessed through the optic uh, in case you have an optic failure. But otherwise, the manipulation of the two pistols is very, very similar. Now again, what really brought me to this class is the different way of manipulating the trigger. Now, when we teach new shooters to shoot, we teach them to pin the trigger and hold the trigger to the rear through recoil. We can commonly call this follow through. So when you fire the shot and watch my trigger finger, you press the trigger to the rear. Now you keep the trigger held to the rear. The handgun recoils, the slide cycles, the sights come back down onto the target. Then you release the trigger forward and you'll hear that click. That is trigger reset. Now we don't go any further than that click. We don't release all the slack in the trigger and we don't remove our finger from the trigger. We just get that click and then we begin the cycle of pulling the trigger again. So 
That is how we teach new shooters to shoot because we want that follow through. We want to avoid uh, shooters slapping the trigger through a flinch. Now, we teach to shoot from trigger reset mainly because we want to avoid flinching. Um, but that is not the fastest way to manipulate the trigger because there is a lot of dead time in there. I'm not beginning to apply pressure to the trigger again until after the sights have settled on the target. Uh, so there's all this time when the gun is recoiling uh, that there's no way for me to prevent that movement. It has to occur. Even if I put the tightest vice grip in the world on the handgun, the handgun is still going to move and the sights are still going to track off target. So instead of using that dead time for nothing, why don't we reset the trigger in that movement? And that is really what he teaches. Uh, JJ teaches that when you fire the shot, as the gun recoils, you're recycling the trigger and you're applying pressure back on, bringing it right up to that wall, right where the trigger is about to break. That way, when the sights come back down on the target, you simply confirm your sight picture and press the shot off again uh, and repeat the process over and over again. The amount of time that you refine the sight picture will be dependent upon um, how difficult a shot you have to make. So if you're making a 25 yard shot uh, on a smaller piece of steel, uh, then you're gonna refine that sight picture a little bit faster than if you are firing two shots on the A zone of a target that is right up in your face. If that's the point, you're probably not even gonna use a sight picture. Uh, you're just gonna drive the gun out and instinctively fire for the center of the target. Um, that close, if we're talking about very close paper targets, uh, then I can usually drill them very fast looking over the sights of the gun, just using the silhouette of the gun as an index on the target. Uh, so that is the first thing that he taught. And I will tell you that switching gears, going from uh, using that trigger reset and uh, firing from a good follow through every time, and then going into resetting the trigger in recoil was definitely a shocking experience for me. Um, we started out on the first day doing some five shot drills uh, on the center of a target. Uh, he drew about a three inch circle in the center of the A zone uh, on an IPSC target. And uh, of course, I don't have any problems from uh, seven yards firing all five shots in that circle. Uh, but then when we started to do these trigger reset drills to where we're resetting the trigger in recoil and getting back uh, to ready to drop that shot again, uh, there were a couple of times where I had ADs, accidental discharges, where I did not intend to fire the gun, uh, but because I reset the trigger too aggressively and I kicked off another shot where I kicked a couple of shots out. Uh, that is the learning process though, and the way the class is structured, it's not unsafe. It's something that is expected to occur uh, while you're learning the new technique. Now, once you've figured out where that limit is, you dial it back a little bit so you're not applying that much pressure to the trigger uh, when you reset it. Now, here's where I have to make a very, very, very important point. Um, we are talking about competition shooting. We are not talking about tactical shooting. Uh, while some of this will translate into the tactical environment, for instance, if I decide that I'm going to fire until a threat stops, uh, then I can reset and recoil because with a handgun like this, or even with the tactical version, when I am resetting in recoil, my sights are not tracking off of the target. I'm not pointing all the way over the target. I am still sights on target while I'm applying pressure to the trigger on a target that I intend to shoot again. So there's nothing intrinsically unsafe about it once you perfect the technique. Uh, but in the beginning, there is the possibility for firing shots when you don't intend to fire shots. And that would be a bad thing tactically. So you have to decide what techniques are applicable in what situations. So that is one that it definitely increased my speed. But moreover, uh, what is really interesting about this technique is we are taking up so much pressure and we are taking up so much movement on the trigger and we are getting right at that hair's edge where it's about to fire. Because handguns have such a short barrel, if we crank that trigger really fast, if the sights are on target, it's almost impossible to pull a gun off target 
before the bullet has left the muzzle. And when the bullet has left the muzzle, it's going where the sights were last pointed. So when we moved into the second portion of the class where we were doing target transitions, what we would actually do is you would reset and recoil and move the gun. So we would start doing bump transitions, which is firing one shot on one target and then transitioning to the next target, but your transition is through recoil. So we would prep the trigger and on command, you would press the trigger and move the gun. And it was not a press the trigger, fire the shot, and then move the gun. It was press the trigger and fire the gun as you track over to the next target. That is what they call a bump transition. So in order to do it correctly, you are sending the command to press the trigger and move the gun at the same time. Now, as long as you don't get it out of sequence, uh, then you hit the target because the bullet has left the muzzle before you can send the signal to your muscles to move the gun. So that kind of takes away that whole notion that uh, we need follow through on a handgun uh, to prevent dipping rounds into the dirt. Uh, the flinch comes before you pull the trigger on new shooters. The flinch does not come after you pull the trigger. So setting that, uh, prepping that trigger right to the point where it's about to break, then pressing the shot and moving the gun is really the quickest way to get a shot on one target and then move on to the next target. And from there, it was just stringing things together. Um, the Next portion of the class, he went into what they call control targets and attack targets. Control targets are smaller, more difficult targets, either a partial target or a piece of steel that is farther away uh, that requires a refined sight picture. Attack targets are targets that are up close uh, that you can engage very rapidly. And so what he went into in the next portion of the class was um, being able to string together uh, shot sequences uh, where you are shooting control targets with a refined sight picture, and then you are shooting attack targets very quickly. And the big portion of that day was stringing together uh, those various different uh, targets uh, in order to uh, combine that and be able to shoot it as fast as possible. Uh, so for instance, if you had to fire one shot on a control target and then two shots on a different target, which is an attack target, instead of what you would normally have where it would be bam, 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 it would be bam, bam, bam. You would, as soon as you broke the shot and moved, and then on to the next one, it would sound like three shots fired in an even cadence instead of one shot and then two shots. Um, that again also took quite a bit of getting used to. Now, in the tactical world, that could apply if you have multiple targets that you need to engage quickly. Uh, say for instance, uh, in a SWAT scenario, if you had a hostage target and then you had other targets that are still threats, uh, then you've evaluated the scene as soon as you've seen it, you know what are threats, you know what needs to be engaged, and then you execute the plan. Um, that's a little far-fetched because in a hostage situation, you would have teammates that would hopefully be engaging the other targets simultaneously while you're engaging the hostage target uh, or the hostage taker. Um, but that's just kind of an idea of where it could play out. If you are an armed citizen and counting multiple attackers, then it might be a situation where you've determined that all of them are threats that need to be neutralized and shooting them quickly uh, is probably a good idea to prevent from getting shot. So uh, we went through that, the control and the attack targets, how to string various sequences together. And he started out very easy with just one control and one attack. Uh, and then we led up to where we were transitioning between multiples back and forth to the point where uh, we were really heating the guns up and you were just jamming mags as fast as you could jam mags. And pretty much everyone picked it up very quickly. Uh, and when you come off the stage and you ran it clean and you ran it correct, you really, really felt good about it. And JJ was great about giving input. Uh, as soon as you came off, he, he would tell you what you could do better or tell you what you screwed up um, and uh, really was very supportive and uh, made you feel good about your runs uh, when you did it clean and you did it correctly. Um, he then went on into uh, movement, moving from uh, firing point to firing point. Uh, this is one that will still take a lot of time for me to get into my head. 
um, because the movement, again, depended upon those attack or control targets. It depended on moving from one box to another box, what targets you had to shoot in the box, what targets you had to shoot in route, what targets you had to shoot from the other box. Uh, so it's a little bit of stage planning, uh, which stage planning doesn't really apply to the tactical world, but the movement does. Uh, the control and attack targets still translates over into the tactical world because you're just worried about the difficulty of a target. Um, now, obviously, in the tactical world, everything is not set up and everything's not standing still, so you can look and go, well, I can move here, I can do this, I can make these steps. Um, but getting the movement down, learning how to move your body smoothly, uh, learning how aggressively you can move and still get shots uh, on relatively difficult targets is a very important thing to know and it's a very important thing to practice uh, so that if you need to pull it out in the real world then it's automatic. Uh, now everything that he was teaching uh, will be something I can directly apply when I shoot competitions uh, so it was very valuable for me in both sides of the house. So those were a broad generalization of the topics that he covered. Um, I could not even come close to pinpointing each and every topic that he covered and do it justice at all. I will just leave with saying, if you have the opportunity to take one of JJ's classes, it is definitely well worth it, even if you don't believe uh, that you have any desire to be a master class competition shooter. Uh, if you just want to get a little bit better at shooting competitions, uh, it's a great course. If you really want to get better at just gun handling in general, uh, then it's a good course. One thing I will say that it is not a good course for is if you are a new shooter and you are not really spot on with weapons manipulation, it's probably not a course for you. You probably need to go with some... Uh, easier, more basic courses uh, that are just getting you through reloads and transitioning to different targets. Um, none of the students that were in this class had any accuracy issues. None had any basic manipulation issues that had to be fixed. Uh, I could definitely see that if we had a student in the class that had basic problems, um, just even keeping aware of which direction that muzzle's pointing, it would have really caused some problems in the class because there are a lot of things that are moving quickly. Uh, students are going in and out and reloading. Um, you're getting back on the line. So uh, a lot of it just really is taking uh, all of your good gun handling and moving it up another notch to that next level. So what I really wanted to talk to or talk about in the second half of this video is how you prepare for a class like this, uh, because these classes are very fast paced. Uh, we shot, uh, the class description said bring a thousand rounds. I think I shot about 900 in two days. Uh, so 900 rounds in two days is a fairly rapid pace when you figure uh, you're going to be sitting in the classroom getting the concepts, but then you're going out on the range and practicing them. And we had seven students in this class, so it was a lot of trigger time for each student. So there are some things that you can do to get the most out of the class, uh, because showing up to one of these classes and having gear issues really can derail the learning process. Uh, so the first thing I'm going to tell you is Know your equipment. Do not take a new gun to a class. Uh, if you're shooting a class like this, you want something that you are familiar with that you know works. Uh, this Legion has had probably about uh, 2,000 rounds on it before I took it to this class. Uh, so I knew the gun worked. I knew the sights were zeroed. I knew everything was locked on with it. Uh, so I knew I wasn't going to have any problems at all. However, I still brought a backup gun. Uh, now again, they aren't the same gun. I wish I had the budget to have two legions, um, but I really, I don't, I didn't, uh, I didn't really think I was going to be as enamored with the legion as I have been. So when I first bought it, it was going to be a try for a competition gun for a year and see if I liked it or if I went back to Glocks. I do really, really like it. So at some time in the future, I may buy a second P320 legion. Um, but my backup gun was a P320 RX full uh, with the Romeo 1 sight on it. 
Uh, the grip is exactly the same grip angle between the P320 X5 Legion and uh, the full. Now, this isn't the grip it came with. This is a Grey Guns laser stippled grip. Uh, so the grip texture is not quite as aggressive as the Talon grip tape that I have on the Legion, uh, but it is fairly aggressive. But more importantly, it is the exact same angle, and I index the gun in the exact same places. So the Tang... Uh, hits the web of my thumb in the same spot. I have the exact same takedown lever on it. Uh, so that is the point of contact for my support side thumb. So the gun presents in the exact same way. Now recoil is not exactly the same because this is a much lighter gun uh, than the Legion. So it will have a little bit higher recoil. So the timing will be slightly different on the gun. Uh, and it has a flat trigger that feels the same between the two, but the trigger pull is slightly different. Uh, so switching back and forth between the two, I would take a couple of minutes to get the timing and get the trigger feel down uh, before I could have max performance out of this gun if I switch right away. Uh, Magwell is exactly the same, so reloading the gun is exactly the same, and the reach to the slide stop is exactly the same. And most importantly, they take exactly the same holster. Uh, so the one holster that I brought works for both guns. The one mag pouch that or the mag pouch setup that I have works for both guns, and the magazines work for both guns. So my backup gun uh, is just basically spare parts all assembled, ready to go. Uh, all the other gear works with both. Now I want to talk about magazines really quickly. Um, Magazines for this class, uh, I went in, I think I took 13 or 14 magazines. Um, the lowest capacity magazine that I have was 17 round magazines. Uh, most of them were 21 round magazines. Uh, so I could stuff those full at the beginning of the day and uh, not really worry about jamming rounds when we broke to go back into the classroom. Uh, this helped me spend more time concentrating on what JJ was saying uh, versus sitting there and getting my magazines loaded back up for when we go into the range and not uh, run the next class. Uh, so that is really, really important. Uh, secondly is the loader that I used uh, really helped things because when it was time to load magazines, I could load them very quickly. So I used a ETS cam loader. Um, the cam loader is not my favorite uh, because with the factory metal SIG magazines, it sometimes has some hiccups. Um, with polymer magazines like the regular ETS magazines, it's very slick and very quick. Uh, but once you learn the technique to load the uh, steel magazines, uh, it's still really quick. Uh, it basically acts like a stripper clip for handgun ammo. Uh, all the ammo I shot for this was uh, Blazer uh, Brass 147. Uh, so that comes in a plastic tray. So it was really easy to grab five rounds at a time. Uh, the loader will hold 10 rounds in its stick. So you go five, five, put the little T-handle on it, jam your rounds in, and it loads 10 rounds just like that. Uh, so then five and five more, boom, it's in, and that's a magazine loaded. Uh, is a lot quicker uh, than even sitting there with a uh, Maglula pushing down each round and reloading it. Uh, now, if I had to reload with no loading device, uh, it would have been pretty miserable. My thumbs uh, would have been pretty sore at the end of the day. So in a class where you see something like a thousand rounds over two days, it's really in your best interest to bring some kind of loading assist device even if it is just something like the factory loader that comes with Glock magazines, uh, where you're just pushing that top round so you can slide the next one in, uh, those are considerably slower, uh, but it will save your thumbs from pushing those rounds down time and time again. And again, uh, that will make things more enjoyable. So many magazines and some way to load them. Uh, now, when we're talking about many magazines, uh, there are a lot of times where there are magazines on the floor. There were several times when students were looking for other magazines. Uh, so make sure you mark your mags. Um, I just write my last name on all my mags because it makes it really easy to see. Uh, something like a oil-based uh, Sharpie marker uh, works really well. Um, 
I just recently got these oil-based Sharpies and I've been going through and remarking everything. Uh, previously, I just used a regular silver Sharpie um, and that really, um, it works for a while, but it rubs off uh, through handling and you have to go back and reapply it. So I'm hoping that the oil-based Sharpie uh, last a little bit longer uh, before I have to go back through and reapply. Uh, but marking all your mags is really important. It'll help make sure they get back, especially when we're talking about things like uh, the Legion mags. And we had two other shooters there that were shooting uh, P320 X5 Legions. Uh, so we all had the exact same base plate magazines. So it's important to get your magazines back. Um, now, for me, uh, if I got mixed up and got one of their magazines by mistake, it would probably be to my benefit uh, because my magazines have been skipped across concrete and rocks and stepped on in that quite a bit. Um, most of the other magazines probably would have been a little bit newer, but mark your mags. Uh, it definitely helps out. So then we come down to gun problems. Now I mentioned make sure that you don't take a new gun to a class. It's a gun you're familiar with. It's a gun that you have done a pretty considerable run-in on so that you know it's going to function. But then secondly, you need to make sure that all your fasteners are tight um, and that everything is marked. So most of the guns in this class uh, were running optics. Uh, there were only a couple of guys that did not have an optic on their gun. And we did have a couple of guys have optics come loose in the class. Um, that is a huge, huge problem because quite a bit of what we were working on required some accuracy at longer distances. Uh, so if your sight came loose and you lost your zero, these dot sights on these guns do not return to zero really well after they come loose. Uh, it's not like a QD mount on a precision rifle where usually you can take the scope off, put it back on, and have it very, very close. Uh, depending upon the slide cut and the specific optic and slide combination, uh, you can get wild differences in zero uh, if your screws loosen up and then you tighten them back down. So couple of ways to avoid this. First of all, before you go to the class, it's important to make sure that your screws are Loctited and that they are torqued to the manufacturer's specifications. If you're not putting optics on with a torque wrench, you're not doing it correctly. Uh, they need to be torqued in. If you cannot find a manufacturer specified torque rating, uh, then there are several fastener manufacturers out there that will have torque specifications on their website uh, for the specific uh, fastener size that you are working with. So you can go look that up if you know your fastener size and look at the specific torque recommendations for them. So Loctite it and torqued into place and then take your Sharpie and draw witness marks across the fastener. So it's just a simple line across the head of the fastener and onto the body of the optic. So you can look at it at a glance and tell if that fastener has moved. What this also helps you is if for some reason you have to undo that fastener and you don't have a torque wrench with you and you need to tighten it back down, very often you can tighten it until the witness mark lines back up and be really close. You won't be dead on on the torque because the fasteners do stretch. Uh, but you will be very close. So if you have to relock tight and put them back on, you will get close. Uh, make sure you use the correct Loctite for the fasteners that you're using. Uh, when we get into these optics, we are right on that breaking point between blue Loctite and purple Loctite. So regular strength or uh, low strength Loctite. Um, I've seen a couple of situations now where shooters have used blue Loctite on things like the uh, CNH Precision mounting plate uh, and had uh, fasteners seize up in the uh, plate itself and uh, either heat or uh, drilling was required to get them out. So make sure you use the correct Loctite and the correct torque specs. Don't just crank it down. Now, uh, optics are fairly reliable. Uh, the Delta Point Pro, I like running the Delta Point Pro because I can replace the battery um, without removing the optic. But if you have an optic that requires removal to replace the battery, you may want to consider replacing the battery with a high-end battery before you go to the class. So replace the battery, get the optic back on, uh, torqued and Loctited, and then marked 
and then go out and check your zero on the optic and get it dialed in. Uh, having the optic come loose and then having to failing a couple of drills and then having to tighten it down and then having to re-zero the optic and go back and forth, um, it can really cause some problems. Now, thankfully, the way that JJ was running his class uh, and the point where the shooters were having failures, uh, it was not that big of a deal because we were kind of running a round robin type deal. Uh, so it would only be a couple of shooters on the line at a time. So it was easy for those shooters that were having problems to go out, try to fix their problems, come back in, jump in the line. Uh, if they were still having problems, they weren't really holding anyone else up because we were just cycling through. So not a big deal there. Um, secondly, iron sights are not immune to problems. Uh, at least one of the shooters was running a box stock legion uh, that has the iron sight plate on it. Uh, and at some point, the screws started to back out of the plate on the underside of the Legion slide. Now, this is kind of an irritation because, again, you still, you've got a plate and the plate is a little bit loose in there. Um, I didn't get a chance to shoot his gun to see if there was any zero shift from um, before the plate came loose to after we tightened the plate back down. But uh, to get to both the screws uh, that are holding the plate on, you have to remove the slide from the gun, and then you have to remove the back plate and the ejector depressor or extractor depressor, and uh, that allows you then to get to them. You can't just pull the slide and get to the right side screw from underneath because the uh, spring... Uh, for the extractor is blocking it. Uh, so we had to get in, we had to get that fixed. Um, because we are doing some armors inspections at work, uh, the kit that I normally take with me to competitions, I left at work. So I didn't have my fix-it sticks, I didn't have my Loctite and all that that I normally carry with me. I made sure my guns were good before I left. I didn't think to bring tools uh, for other shooters. Um, but that brings us to the next point. Even if you think your stuff is 100% locked on, bring tools. Um, Loctite and uh, wrenches to work on your stuff is a really, really good option. Now, the Delta Point Pro, as well as the Trigicon RMR, and quite a few other sites out there, um, they designed the adjustment screws on them really well so that you can take the... Uh, head of a case or the rim of a case and use that to change your elevation and windage adjustments to zero your optic. Um, optics like the Romeo 1 do not have that. Uh, the Romeo 1 actually requires a flat blade screwdriver and a fairly fine flat blade screwdriver to get in there and actually turn the windage and elevation adjustments. Uh, so if you require tools to adjust your optic, make sure you bring those tools. Um, cleaning, we'll talk about cleaning real quick because it is not something that I really do. Um, I don't clean guns when I am at uh, classes because a lot of times you can cause problems. I do bring lubricants so that if I notice the gun starts to get sluggish and when you're shooting a high-end handgun at a very fast pace... Uh, you can notice, at least I can notice, when the gun starts to slow down because the timing will change on the gun. Uh, so that's when you know you probably need to take a break and uh, lubricate the gun and get it back up and going. Uh, the Legion, I really didn't have to do anything to it the whole time. Um, it was already um, pretty foul uh, when I took it into the class, uh, even more so now, uh, but I never noticed a slowdown on it. So I don't really have any desire to spend the evening after the class uh, tearing the guns apart and cleaning them. I'd much rather just wipe them down, uh, throw them back in the bag, and uh, go on with things. Uh, in the Using this class for an example, uh, after the class was done, everyone went out to dinner, we relaxed, rehashed some of the points of the class, talked about other things in our lives, and it's just a really nice time. Uh, to socialize with other people that are in the class. I didn't really have to worry about uh, going back and doing weapons maintenance. I knew the guns will survive uh, more than a thousand rounds without having to uh, do anything to them at all. Again, that's because I shoot them quite a bit. Uh, 
Uh, there are guns out there that will not be able to tolerate that, and you probably do need to break them down and clean them, but you should know if that applies to your gun or not. Uh, one thing that I do recommend is bring anything that you would need to clean your optic. Uh, so bring lens cleaning solution, a lens wipe, a lens pen. Um, all of that stuff is really important. Uh, even if you change your batteries right before the class, bring spare batteries. Uh, spare batteries are always a good thing to have. So basically, you want everything that you can to be self-supporting uh, so that if you have anything go down during the class, it's a quick break, swap it out, fix it, get it back up and running, and get back in. And that will really help you uh, concentrate on the learning environment and not working on the gear. This also applies to your rig, your holster, your mag pouches. Uh, hopefully it's all stuff that you have worked with before you've gone to the class. Um, I know guys that will go to classes and they will use them as a test ground for new equipment. I've gone to matches and use them as a test ground for new equipment. I knew I wasn't going to do the greatest in the match, um, but I was there to have some fun and try some things out. Uh, usually I try to at least have one range session on stuff before I take it to a class or to a match. Uh, but it really does a disservice to the other students in the class uh, if the instructor has to spend a lot of time trying to fix your problems uh, versus just teaching the class. Now, some really large classes where they're assistant instructors it's not a huge deal because uh, the primary instructor can just tag one of his assistant instructors and take you off to the side and fix your stuff. Um, but give a second thought before you try new things at a class regarding new gear, new stuff. Now, the mental aspect when you go into a class, um, I have got a lot of shooting biases. I've been shooting for quite some time, so I have a lot of things that I like to do a certain way. Um, I have a certain way that I draw. I have a certain way that I reload. I have a certain way that I move. Um, so it's difficult when I go into a class to break those habits. But the purpose of going to a class is not to show an instructor how you shoot. Uh, the purpose of going to a class is to learn the information that the instructor has. To do that, you need to come into it with an open mind. So it's not so much forget everything that you knew, but try new things even if they are counter to what you normally do. As long as it is a safe technique, as long as you are pointing the weapon in the correct direction, you're not flagging students, you're not flagging yourself, uh, then try the new technique. Uh, now, there is a little bit of caution in there. I knew going into this that I am taking a class from a world-class shooter that has competed around the planet. Um, you don't get to that level by being unsafe with a handgun because you will get kicked out of matches if you're unsafe with a handgun. So I wasn't really worried about the safety aspect of it. Uh, there are some instructors out there that don't have very good credentials and uh, probably should not be teaching classes that do try to teach unsafe techniques. We've all seen the videos. Uh, we've seen the Instagram, the YouTube. We've seen the Facebook BS. Um, you've got guys out there like Voda Consulting and all this nonsense that are teaching unsafe things, things that will get someone hurt or killed in the real world. So be prepared to throw the bullshit flag if you think something is unsafe. Uh, but give the instructor an opportunity to explain yourself. If you still think it's unsafe, then it may be time to pop smoke in e and &E. uh, But if it's not safety related, try a new technique. Give it an honest run. Really try to learn it. Uh, there are some things that I found through this class that are much faster than what I've been doing. But uh, because I have those previous biases, it is going to take me quite a few reps to get past what I was previously doing and implement the new technique. I already went to the range for a couple of sessions uh, trying to get these new techniques down, and it is going to take me quite a few sessions more uh, to get them down. You can teach an old dog new tricks. It just takes a whole lot more times going to the range uh, to get it done. So 
That is about all I'm going to say in this video. Uh, I think it's gone a little bit long already, but hopefully you guys got something out of it. So um, if you guys have any questions about the JJ Rikaza class, drop them in the comment section down below, or any questions about prepping your gear, taking your gear to class, drop them down below. And if you've got any stories of horrible classes, horrible instructors, or just horrible gear failures, please Drop them in the comments down below. I would love to hear them, and I'm sure the rest of our audience would love to check it out as well. That's going to do it for this Mail Call Mondays. If you guys like the video, please make sure you like, share, and subscribe. If you dislike the video, make sure you click the dislike too. If you guys want to know how to support more content that you guys know and love, then check us out over on Patreon. And until next time, get out and shoot. So overall, what I wanted out of this video is to give you guys a uh, insight into the JJ Rikaza class. I greatly enjoyed it. This will probably not be the last class that I take from him. Uh, again, he's a very skilled instructor, very skilled uh, shooter, and it was just a ton of fun to go through this class. But I also wanted to give you guys a little bit of insight on things uh, to keep in mind when you go to these classes to try to stay out of trouble. Um, make sure you know your gear, make sure you have run your gear in before, have all the tools to work on your gear, and really 